Um, I've been asked to do this. I think the best thing to do is just tell you a bit about myself and um, sort of set a little bit of agenda for this evening. I've been asked to keep this to about 45 minutes as a talk, and then we'll have some Q&A at the end. Um, so I know that I've got some questions which have been sent through beforehand. If you can use the Q&A tab on here to basically send through any questions during the talk, then we'll pick those up at the end. Obviously, this is a bit difficult to make it interactive on this sort of um, platform, but we'll do our best. And I'll do my best to pick up most of the issues that I know are out there. Um, somebody asked me uh, recently how long I've been bird watching, and I'm coming up to my 50th anniversary of the first list that I ever wrote down. I don't know what that means in terms of how long I've been um, watching birds, certainly for as long as I can remember, and more than that. Um, in terms of raptors, I suppose this is one of the perennial problem areas, if you like, from the rarities panel, which I sit on for Hoss. And particularly in people are coming forward saying, I think I've seen this, but I'm not sure. So the easiest way to give people the confidence to both identify and recognize and then report species is to do talks such as these. So um, as I say, I'm an active birder in Hampshire. I also lead tours for Nature Trek uh, across the world, particularly in Africa and Europe. And uh, the key for that is, is not only birds, but uh, I've had a particular interest in birds. So we can move on fairly quickly to uh, the talk this evening, which is really to focus on those raptors which are present in Hampshire and a little bit of a guide to the, the 14 most recognizable and most frequently seen species that you're likely to encounter across the county. So without any further ado, I'll start off and sort of set, set the scenes. So what are raptors? I think if you look at a definition, it's interesting how um, when I started, there was no such thing as raptors being uh, velociraptors. But after Jurassic Park, if you talk to people, most people sometimes come back and sort of say, well, I thought raptors were dinosaurs. And of course, to some extent, there is a good linkage there because birds are one of the few groups of animals that are direct descendants of um, the dinosaurs, but they are a specialist group of birds. And in this instance, and for this talk, we're talking about diurnal birds of prey. In other words, we're not talking about owls, we're talking about um, eagles or hawks or falcons that basically eat meat, birds and other animals. Not always those that kill to do that, although that's obviously the source point of the name. So as I say, we have 14 species which are regularly reported in Hampshire. The Seven of those are resident species and probably the ones which most people are most familiar with because they're more recognizable um, on the daily trips out or um, in the neighborhood, wherever you uh, watch birds in the, in the county. The falcons, particularly peregrine and kestrel, Asipitus, the sparrowhawk and the goshawk, the buzzard, which has massively increased its range since the millennium, the red kite, which hopefully for more of us is a familiar species after the introduction program and the spread. And one which is a more recent um, uh, visitor and now resident in the county, that's of the Marsh Harrier, which um, has been increasing year on year. On top of that, we have two summer visitors, the falcon, the hobby, which is a specialist insect eater and hirundine eater, and the honey, honey buzzard, which also is, uh, doesn't actually eat honey and isn't a buzzard, but apart from that is a good name for one of our most enigmatic species, which is, um, finds its home particularly in the New Forest. 
the winter visitors, Hen, Harrier and Merlin. They move into the county more rarely now than they used to, but uh, for the winter period and the New Forest and the coast are good places for both species. We then have two regular migrants, Osprey, which is increasingly seen and actually is a typical regular migrant in terms of in spring, it tends to come through heading north and uh, travels fairly quickly, but tends to spend quite a lot of time then heading back south. And that's when it's best to try and connect with the species uh, in the autumn when it normally hangs up for two or three weeks, Farlington and more recently Fish Lake Meadows are a good example of that. And hopefully in the future, we will see ospreys nesting more closely to our areas of the coast, potentially Paul Harbour as well as the more successful one at Butland Water at the moment. And therefore we should see an increase in the number of ospreys in our area. Historically, we've also had Montague's Harrier, and it has been a nesting species, certainly um, within my memory, um, in the forest and more locally up on the Wiltshire border. But unfortunately, it's decreased substantially, not only in the county, but also in the UK as a whole, and is now only um, a very scarce summer migrant and in fact is now a rarities panel species. And of course, the one which is in the news at the moment and is going to be more in the news at the weekend is the white-tailed eagle. Um, part of a reintroduction program uh, based on the Isle of Wight, which you can hear more about on Saturday. Um, but it's interesting to say that not all of the eagles that have been seen in Hampshire um, are actually part of local reintroduction programs. And certainly we have had birds wandering from further afield in the past. So those are the most likely species to be seen. And I think it's fair to say that there's a particular buzz associated with watching raptors. They are, I think most bird watchers will, will agree, they are exciting. They're challenging but they're always something that can be uh, memorized and seem to be one of the highlights of any days. Unfortunately for us in terms of identification, most of the problems come from the fact that we don't see them very often. And that most of the time we see them either for a very short period of time or at enormous distances, and quite often both. And that's something that basically means that we never really get to grips with them and they don't become part of our um, combined understanding of how they work and how they fly and, and that leads to problems with identification. I think it's fair to say that um, with the exception of potentially Kestrel, Sparrowhawk, buzzard, and now we can add in, certainly in the northern part of the county, red kite to that. Very few of these are seen anything approaching regularly by most observers. And I think, as I said, most of them are seen flying. And therefore, when effectively, if you think of it from most bird watching approaches, you wait until a bird lands and then you try and identify it with raptors you're forced in most instances to basically try and identify the species when it is flying, quite often flying away from you. The odd thing is, in, in reverse, that quite a lot of what we talk about for the rest of the day is really focused on identifying raptors that are flying, and therefore those which are perched can actually be quite confusing. We'll try and pick that up. In terms of practice, and I think is a clear face that says that practice makes perfect, practice is something which is needed to become, to bring familiarity. 
And familiarity brings confidence and understanding of how to tell one species from another. So any opportunity to watch raptors, I suggest is taken, even if it's a case of sitting in the back garden watching the buzzards or the sparrowhawks, if you're lucky, or perhaps even as for myself, I have uh, red kites over the back garden on a daily basis. So once you have an anchor of a key species and you recognize how it flies, the structure that the bird has, as well as some of the plumage details, you're able there to, for, to compare and contrast whatever you're seeing with something that you feel confident with. And it may start off with being a case of saying, I know it isn't my familiar species because rather than necessarily knowing what it is to start off with. There are a few raptor viewpoints which are recognizable, some sort of ad hoc on the coasts, the familiar locations where birds are seen. Uh, Fish Lake Meadows for marsh harriers is a good place and also hobbies. Uh, Darlington and Keyhaven, again, for wintering species. Um, marsh harriers are there and present most of the time. And a couple of locations uh, in the New Forest, which are uh, regularly touted as being good places to see raptors, but it doesn't mean you have to travel to see them. Anywhere which gives you a good view of habitat, and I'll mention habitat a bit later on, is a good place to try and find raptors. And these are going to be ones which are generally flying and generally a common species. Of course, more recently, Winchester Cathedral and some other locations have had set up to look at urban peregrines. And they're another good example of seeing those species in a regular and familiar setting, which can bring that familiarity of one species or another in the key location. I think at the back of that, we have to sort of say, well, what are actually happening with our birds? And I think it's, it's a mixed story, really. Most people will know that the low point in the 60s and the 70s following DTD, DDT poisoning meant that a large number of our species were in dire problems and were likely to um, be extinct if something was not done. Added to that was years of persecution, keepering that basically um, controlled many of predatory species, including birds of prey, which basically meant that I think when I first started, um, you know, it really was a case of saying that a raptor was something which was unlikely to be seen except in very exceptional circumstances. We now are in much more positive times, but it's fair to say that most species are not really understood of how many are actually in the local population. For example, kestrel is widespread, but it's declining. We know it's declining, but not really quite sure what the overall population is. Sparrowhawks have increased rapidly after DDT went out of the local environment. Um, but seem to be declining again. In Hampshire, we have a growing population of goshawks, probably between 40 and 50 pairs, focused on the new forest, but the tantalizing glimpses of birds elsewhere. We have um, evidence, unfortunately, that goshawks basically do have an impact upon kestrel and sparrowhawk populations certainly in some places. Hobbies, about 20 pairs, and we can go on with that. But I think it's fair to say that buzzards are now widespread. Red kite is a real success story. We have over 400 pairs breeding in the county. And there's over, if you look at sort of the autumn populations, we probably have over 1500 birds um, 
moving around the county. Um, roughly speaking, four to five, maybe 600 young birds within them, because it's not only local birds that make up the population, but we see birds coming from other areas into this, and our birds go elsewhere as well. And perhaps the same will happen with the white-tailed eagle in the future. We're already seeing them wandering the coast, and the birds go across the Hampshire area, and we will come out and see them more frequently within that. And of course, we've already mentioned the peregrine. So it's fair to say that most of them are increasing. Unfortunately, as I mentioned before, Montague's Harrier is decreasing. Merlin and Hen Harrier are also struggling. And Hen Harrier particularly is part of the UK decline, um, which has, has been lost as an uh, English breeding species. And I think it's fair to say that um, now when we used to have about 20 birds in the winter, it's unusual to see five birds uh, in the roosts. So let's move on to, after a quick introduction to what to expect, to what to look for. And I think the important thing to do before you even get down to what do individual species look like is actually look at the structure and the size of the birds. And I think it's fair to say that the first thing you, it says on this list is size. And that is often incredibly difficult to tell. Most birds of prey are single, uh, rarely in pairs or small groups, very often on their own and distance. So actually getting something to directly compare with is actually quite difficult. So size is something if you can pick it up. Um, as an aside, I, I had a, I was lucky enough to be watching a pair of soaring goshawks today. Um, and when a crow and a buzzard went to try and shoo them away, it became evident how big they really were. Um, but otherwise, confusion with sparrowhawk is actually quite commonplace. And, but they do not overlap in size. There is a lot of paperwork in places which basically say that a, um, a female sparrowhawk can be as big as a, uh, a male goshawk. It's not true. Uh, they, they are distinctively bigger. Um, all goshawks are much bigger. And uh, a male is about the size of a crow, whilst the, a female sparrowhawk is slightly bigger than a a jackdaw. So they are, they are substantially different in size. But it's very, very difficult to see that in a standalone um, position. The more important thing is to look at the structure of the birds and how they fly. So it's whether they are holding their wings either flat in a V slightly raised, slightly bowed. A red kite will basically bow its wings down in flat flight. A buzzard will lift up its ends and a harrier is a distinct V. Each species and each species group has a different face on aptitude to how it holds its wings normally. And the word must be focused on normally. If they move in from a saw into a, um, a stoop, or obviously change their attitude because of wing, wind speed, then they can approximate virtually any other wing shape they want. And there is a confusion that therefore comes from it. So it's looking at what their natural and their relaxed wing shape is going to be. With birds of prey also, there's a very important thing called hand. And, uh, and that is really where the primaries run from the thing is, if you don't understand how a, a wing works, you can use your own arm to look at it and sort of compare that. The long flight tips, the primaries are effectively related to our hands and fingers. The secondaries are 
associated, associated with our forearm and our upper arm actually is hidden within the body of the bird and in the axillaries. So it doesn't actually come across. So it's not directly analogous, analogous between the shape of our hand and how it works. But the hand is an important thing. The hand is really the end of the wing and where it sits. Does it sit forward of the shoulder? Is it pointed? Is it rounded? How many primary feathers is it showing? And together with the length and the shape of the tail are important in recognizing the overall structure of the bird. And these adaptations are really associated with how they feed and on what they feed. Now, sepitas are basically woodland species. They have rounded wings and short and broad, and that enables them to hunt in wooded environments, chasing between trees. And um, basically they use short burst, very powerful flight on the level to basically hunt their prey. Buzzards are predominantly soaring birds, but they're also a mixed feeder. They'll take rabbits, they'll take some carrion. They will effectively um, eat earthworms. You see young buzzards particularly hopping around eating earthworms in the middle of plowed fields quite regularly. So they have a sort of a generalist type of approach it's not really a soaring, they're quite adept at soaring, but it's not really optimized for soaring. It's not optimized for hunting within um, woodlands, but it can do virtually everything. Falcons, very pointed wings, adept, adapted for speed and agility. So what is known as the cord or the depth of the wing from front to back is effectively um, smaller for more agile hunters, hobby and um, merlin, whilst it's much broader for peregrine and kestrels, which are more generalist hunters, although obviously kestrel has the adaptation of hovering. Harriers are really ambush predators. They spend a lot of time at low level, just quartering uh, reed beds and rough grassland. And effectively, they're optimized for uh, keeping themselves aloft and spending a lot of time with low energy, basically quartering the whole areas. And um, in that respect, they're really a, a combination Sora, but they also drop into deep vegetation, so they can't be too broad. So it's, again, it's a compromise. Stability comes from their long tails. And then effectively, you can move on to um, ospreys, which are plunge divers, eagles, which are saurers. And effectively, you can see them with some of these that they basically reflect how they hunt within the shape of the wings and the length of the tails. One point which is a key also, or an aid to identification is understanding the relationship between the size of the wings and the weight of the bird. For example, if you look at the group of harriers, the marsh harrier, the hen harrier, and the Montagues harrier, they're very similar in overall size. If you look at their length um, and their wingspan, particularly between Montagues and Hen Harrier. But actually, what they hunt and how they hunt is quite different. And that's also reflected in their overall weight and also then in terms of the buoyancy of their flight. So, a Montagues Harrier is roughly speaking got the same wing size as a Hen Harrier but actually is only about two thirds of the weight. So when you see it flying, it seems to have an increased buoyancy as it moves along. Kites are also, red kites, are also very lightly loaded birds. And they tend to fly in, um, 
in that slightly more buoyant manner. So you, you can tell that it's um, as, a, as a way of identifying, does it look as though it's got an awful lot of lift about a power in its flight, or is it just sitting there? A hobby looks as though it can turn very, very quickly, which it can, whilst the peregrine basically looks a very solid bird, which it is. The comparison between the two is not really in the wingspan, it's in the caudal length and also the weight. For example, a, a hobby is about a third of a weight of a peregrine, even though the wingspans are at the best getting very close to each other, about 90%. So you can tell that they are adapted and this adaptation really is reflected in the way they fly. And with getting your eye in, you can actually tell the difference. So th this I think is one of the important things to say that habitat, habit and its structure is as important as where the patches of color or patterning actually are in looking at um, birds of prey and raptors. And I think there's the other thing which I think we mustn't sort of overlook within all of this is also that other birds which we are familiar with probably in different situations can also be there um, as a confusion and find themselves in places which we'd expect to see birds of prey. Um, I've seen soaring gulls, I've seen herons, even storks, um, and they can make you some, suddenly look twice and make you wonder, oh, is that a bird of prey or is it something else? It's amazing, as I guide uh, quite regularly um, around the country and overseas, the number of times wood pigeon is basically called as a potential raptor and there seems to be about five different species of wood pigeon, including the peregrine wood pigeon, the sparrowhawk wood pigeon, and the Kestrel wood pigeon. So I think it's, it's a case of being able to recognize the shapes and the forms before then placing over them the plumage details. And really the only way I can describe this is that it is best to look at the birds to actually figure out how it is, but then understand how the adaptations of the wing length, the wing cord, the tail length basically affects the way that the birds fly. And then you can start placing these together as part of building up the picture of what species it is. So if we move on to the species themselves. And in this respect, uh, I start off with probably the most frequent confusion pair. Which is the sparrow cork and the goshawk. In principle, the species are doing the same sort of thing and have a similar adaptation. Although the scale is one which is enormously different. And just to sort of put it in context, uh, a sparrowhawk is about 50% of the size of a goshawk uh, in dimension and is, can be as little, uh, a sparrowhawk can be as little as 20, 25% of the weight of a goshawk. So that size and difference in weight can be seen in the way that they fly their maneuverability and um, how they basically go around their business. Um, I've only once been fortunate enough to see a goshawk hunting at, um, through a woodland at four feet and it, the power of it was absolutely staggering. Um, I've seen sparrowhawks do that sort of thing a number of times, but um, when you see one, you know one, I think is one of the obvious statements within it. From a, a male sparrowhawk is 
substantially smaller than the female. And this sexual dimorphism is actually quite common. It's actually the norm for raptors. The males are generally smaller. And depending upon the nature of the feeding, they can be substantially small. In the case of the um, sparrowhawk, the male is uh, about 60% of the size of the female. So even looking at the difference between the male and the female, you would normally think there could be two different species. So that is part of the initial confusion. So looking at a sparrowhawk and actually establishing whether it is a male or a female is important to start off with. The dimorphism is, is really there as a, um, for two, two key reasons. One is, uh, obviously, that uh, the females are egg carrying, egg laying, so therefore they need additional mass in any case, particularly during the breeding season. Uh, they also need to carry more fat because I'd be sitting on the nest to start off with for longer. Um, but it's also a case in saying that they are taken to extremes within some of the um, raptors because it then enables them to hunt different prey species and therefore they're not directly competing with each other as a pair. So it's something that you'll see um, increasingly as we go through this. There are exceptions uh, where the food differentiation is not so important, so they tend to be roughly speaking the same size, um, but it's still the case that the female is larger because of the need to carry the eggs. So a sparrowhawk male, the blue-gray cast, the rusty underneath is unmistakable. I think it's fair to say it is the females, and particularly the larger females, um, that are probably the more confusing ones because they don't appear to have anything more than this general barring on the underside and um, just appear to be bigger than you'd expect from a normal sparrowhawk. And I think this is, this is one of the things that we then have to look at what else comes into it. The barring is important on the female because that is a feature of the males in the gospel, but not a feature of the females. You've then got the juvenile plumages, which confuse it even more, which tend to be browner. But looking at them, and I think it was one of the questions that was asked, can you tell the difference? I think it's, it's probably easier to we'll move on to the next slide, just to basically talk about the difference between them. Um, and this is easier to, to talk about it because one of the things you have to look at is the structure and, and how they are. Because they are smaller birds, there's actually a difference in the wing shape between the sparrowhawk and the goshawk. The goshawk has got a slightly longer wing, more narrowly pointed wings, not so rounded as a sparrowhawk, even in the... Um, in the male and the smaller birds, uh, talking to the female um, sparrowhawk. And the tail always looks thin. And I would always say across this, you, you, looking at the difference in the hips between the two species, broad hips is sort of a feature of uh, goshawks, and narrow hips is really more of a feature of, of a sparrowhawk. And it's sort of this, this sort of underweight look that um, you get from a sparrowhawk, which you just don't get from a goshawk. And, um, but there are features there which you can look at in shape of the head, the shape of the wings, the combination of all of these. And yes, it's subtle, but this is where practice comes in to actually be able to identify between the two species. And of course, if you haven't got anything that basically tells you what the size is, you are actually building a picture of a whole series of different criteria, which then enable you to say, yes, this is a goshawk or this is a sparrowhawk. There isn't one single feature that can basically tell you at range, this is one or the other if you cannot determine how big it is. If it's suddenly got a buzzard bite and it's bigger than a buzzard, you know it's a goshawk. 
but that's the only way of really saying about it. I think it's fair to say also that these are from flying birds on the ground. They're even more confusing, but there's an inherent power and aggression that is always in all the movements of a goshawk that once you see it, um, really makes you understand that it's never matched by a sparrowhawk, which is actually quite a, it's aggressive, yeah, but it's, 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 um, it hasn't got the same power to its movements and its aptitude. So um, as it says here, you know, the goshawk on the left, more aggressive, the goshawk, sorry, the sparrowhawk on the right, kind, it's, it's a, it's a typical feature that's put there um, in quite a lot of books. It does actually look like that. It looks a slightly softer um, species when you see it up close. Another of the species pair that I'm asked about regularly is buzzard and honey buzzard. And I think part of the problem is the unfamiliarity with honey buzzard and we add to that the variability in plumage of buzzard in fact of both species they're incredibly variable in plumage of course honey buzzard isn't a buzzard and that's the first thing we have to say um, it's actually honey buzzards are one of the Pernis group. They're more related to kites than they are to buzzards in any shape or form. Honey buzzard is a summer migrant and won't be in the UK until they're very, very late arriving. They come in May and effectively leave relatively early in the autumn, generally speaking, late August through to sept early September when they leave these shores. So they're actually here for a relatively short period of time, very specialist feeder, um, feeds on wasp nests predominantly, and still a very scarce species within the county, although um, regularly seen in the New Forest and occasionally elsewhere. Structure plays a part in telling the two. A Honey buzzard will always soar on flatter wings, and that's not just about its aptitude to the body, but it's also the fact that its wings are held more flatly. There's no profile going out to the hand. So from the fore, what we've said, the forearm to the thumb, if you like, there's always got a picture of it in, in uh, the common buzzard. And there's a little picture up here, if we can point it out. So in this sort of area here, you've got a little um, uplift on their bottom. The honey buzzard is actually flat and quite often can be seen on a much flatter uh, plane than that. But it's also the structure of the bird itself. Uh, the tail of a honey buzzard is long and the head is on a long neck and also a fairly small head for the bird size, much smaller. It's quite often called pigeon headed. So it's interesting to say that, you know, honey buzzards you'll see, if you see them at all, generally soaring over woodland, has this very long necked appearance, very long tailed appearance. Some people say that particularly some of the dark phase birds, and you'll see one of them down here, is um, actually can be more confused with a marsh harrier than a, than a buzzard in that respect. Um, but a buzzard is, is one of those important species to get familiar with because it is a good basic species that everything can, can be compared to. You can see the profile of the back of the wing, the bulge in the secondaries. Is a pointer. So the bulge in the second piece is not particularly pronounced on the buzzard and it's much more pronounced on the honey buzzard. It comes to a tighter set of fingers on the honey buzzard. More pronounced head, 
okay, particularly more pronounced tail. And that's important to say, you know, you see a buzzard and you think it's odd, you can determine why. Plumage is also a good pointer. The tail bars here with the very clear three bars, the broad band at the base, plus two other secondary bars closer to the um, base of the tail. Those are distinctive for honey buzzard. A buzzard will show barring in its tail and it will show a terminal band as well, but it will never show something as clearly marked as that. But I would always suggest that the thing to do is to become familiar with buzzards and then look at the difference of how the, the buzzard to honey buzzard comes apart. Um, New Forest again, the acres down, uh, Raptor Viewpoint is probably the most famous one for honey buzzard. There are other honey, honey buzzard um, viewpoints around the country as well. So, um, they are worth having a look at. But a word of warning, as I said before, we're not only talking about adult birds out there, we're talking about how birds progress to adulthood and how they change. And therefore features of plumage can be very different depending on the age. This is effectively a bog standard buzzard. But you can see as it goes from a juvenile through to adult plumage, which is effectively in year um, three to four, then it is basically going through a combination of different plumages and types that change how big the carpal patches are, how much barring is evident, what the tail looks like, how much streaking on the breast and the patterns are. And they are all very variable. If we move on to the honey buzzard, and this is, that's just buzzard. And I'm sure that some of you have seen very white buzzards or very dark buzzards that have confused you. Unfortunately, they're part of the course. And this is honey buzzard that goes from something which is incredibly white. These are just um, all males in adult plumage basically photo montage to help people see the difference. Um, these are all adult birds. Youngsters also have a range of plumages as well as they move into their adult type. You can see they go from ones which are so pale they could be osprey, almost to such dark birds that it could be uh, a marsh harrier if you were caught unawares. And that is accentuated by the long tail and the small head. So yes, to answer a question that came in before, yes, you can tell them apart. Is it straightforward? No. Combination of structure and habitat over woodland, um, soaring on flat wings, the small head, the long tail, they're all key features of trying to distinguish between something. But that's, those differences are really only capable of being brought out if you have already understood how the um, buzzard works. Don't think we need to spend much time on buzzard, on red kite, which is the next one. Uh, the only one I wanted to sort of flag is the juvenile plumage. We are seeing probably four to 500 birds in Hampshire, which are um, juveniles. They can be surprisingly brownish in color. The, they do not have such deeply forked tails and they tend to look certainly less red and can be a good confusion species. Um, and I think it's fair to say that um, quite a lot of records of black height come under derivatives panels because of confusion between most likely juveniles and um, people thinking they don't, they're definitely not a red kite, but um, they could be something else and that something else may be a black kite, but it's more likely to be a juvenile red kite. 
Um, Falcons are basic, as we said before, of the kestrel. Default species is kestrel, should be get familiar with that one. Relatively, for a falcon anyway, relatively short in the wing, but long in the tail. And um, like most of the um, falcons, the juveniles are much more um, spotted than the adult birds. But um, we can see that the sexual dimorphism is, is, is clear in terms of patterning here as well. Kestrel is grayer with much more russet in the um, mantle color. The hobby is an aerial predator. So it captures both dragonflies and herondines on the wing. It, uh, it's, a much more, it's a much faster, much more maneuverable bird. So it has longer wings. You can see here that whilst with a kestrel, it's got shorter wings, they do not reach the tail tip. Whilst with a hobby, the wing tips are at least as long as the tail end when it is perched. Has a similar sort of patterning to a peregrine, but it's a much more slender bird, much more lightly loaded, much more buoyant in flight has a very much thinner um, chest to it. And of course, with the adults, the uh, red trousers is uh, distinctive, although confusingly, they are um, missing from the juveniles. And I think it's more likely that a juvenile is mistaken for a peregrine than anything else. But they don't hunt in the same way and they should be readily distinguishable just by size and, uh, and how they hunt and fly over the habitat that they choose, which is obviously looking for um, dragonflies and flying, small flying birds rather than pigeons and the like, which are peregrine coasted. The two open country birds, yeah, with the, the peregrine on the left and the merlin on the right. Peregrine is another one which, I, because of the um, increasing nesting schemes and um, both webcams and observation points on the cathedrals and other man-made structures, that it's a good one to get experience of what it looks like and how it flies always to me has a relatively chesty appearance to it. So it's very broad across the chest, uh, females more so than males. Um, again, we've got a difference here where the males are effectively 70% of the, the females in size. So that is very much more marked. They have a relatively broad and powerful wing for a, um, a falcon and relatively short tailed generally follows this and, and the, um, the moustachial stripe is very very strong and that is generally um, capable of being seen wherever they're perched up so those are the easiest things to basically point out but it's using those as a standard a merlin is tiny it is um, but oddly enough although we say it's it's tiny it's in a small package, but it's actually quite a, um, a punchy falcon. It's got the same weight as a hobby, even though it's smaller than a hobby. It has a much uh, smaller wingspan than a hobby. And um, although the, and, and it's, well, it's overall it's smaller, but it's actually the same weight as a hobby. So it shows you how much the difference in hunting technique basically leads to a difference in how it has evolved and the Merlin is basically a hunter of open ground for generally um, small birds, uh, pipits, finches, and the like, um, that it basically chases across um, flats, agricultural lands and mud flats, and basically tries to flush them up and then catch them on the wing. So it is a if, if you like, it's a pocket version of a peregrine and goes for, rather than the, the pigeons that uh, 
the peregrine is really trying to hunt. Uh, a merlin is going for something which is substantially smaller and it's a substantially smaller package because of that. Males and females are generally speaking hunting the same prey. So actually the male merlin is about 80% of the size of the um, a female merlin. So whilst with a peregrine, as I said, it's about 70%. So you can see with the change the way that they basically hunt and the um, prey is determining the sexual dimorphism. Harriers is another of the groups which is a challenge for all of us. I think the most familiar one is the marsh harrier and particularly either the adult female or the juvenile generally a fairly all brown bird, fairly broad in the wing and um, has the creamy head and in the female also in the leading edges of the wings is up in here is also a variable amount of um, buff colour. The juveniles are very similar to the adult females but don't have, um, don't have the buff on the front of the wings but do have it on the head. So of all the harriers, the marsh harrier is probably as most familiar now, which is a strange thing to say because it was virtually unheard of until about 20 years ago. Um, and it is also the largest of the harriers. So it's the one which is basically of that group is the easiest to get to grips of to understand how they fly. There's about seven sites um, across the county in which they're regular Farlington, Keyhaven, um, Fish Lake Meadows, Allsford Pond, plus some others that are possible to see them. And they're seen with great regularity, which enables you to get familiar with them. Males are less often seen. Um, I think we had first breeding last year of a pair, but generally speaking, although juveniles and adult females are being seen regularly, males are much more um, rare in terms of being seen. But they are, as I say, large for Harry, but distinctive in terms of this broad shape, the V when they are flying, and the long tail. And the habits of basically quartering in terms of the marsh Harry predominantly uh, rebeds, although they will migrate through the county, and I've seen them on downland as well. Males Typical pattern that comes out for all the harriers, black wingtips, basically grey, but in this instance, very much a brown head and mantle colour, which is um, not seen except in the marsh harrier. Although it's fair to say that juveniles basically go through a stage of going from um, very much the female type plumage to the male type plumage with a horrible mold of bits of grey and bits of brown all over them. And that goes for all three species. Although fortunately Montagues tend not to molt uh, and have those transitionary pro, um, plumages in the UK. So the largest, as I said, was the Marsh Harrier. And um, effectively the smallest is the Montagues Harrier. So the middle one, which is the Hen Harrier, was probably the one that historically has been the most familiar in the county, but has actually become very scarce. Known as the ring tail because of the, um, the white rump patch, which, is, which shows up remarkably well, even in the males, although sometimes people say, oh, I didn't notice I had one in the males, but it's there. But definitely on the females and on the youngsters, the youngsters are similar to the adult females. It's more barred in their approach. And um, again, basically the females are a quartering action, very distinctive with the long tail and relatively broad wings, but not as broad as a marsh harrier. They are also slightly smaller. So from that point of view, we've got um, uh, the hen harrier is smaller than the marsh harrier. Although from a weight perspective, it's not as different as you would expect. Um, 
they're about 80% of the weight of the marsh harrier. Uh, but you can tell that the marsh harrier flies fairly heavily for a harrier anyway. This is where it becomes subtle and difficult to explain. But um, certainly a marsh harrier does not have the same sort of buoyancy in its flight that a hen harrier does. But compared with the two, the Montagues is very lightly loaded. It is about 60% of the weight of the hen harrier, even though it has the same wingspan as the hen harrier. And um, they are incredibly buoyant flights. Some people have called them turn-like flights. Um, it, it's um, surprising and they look incredibly skinny, very long, very thin, very rakish, almost um, incapable of, of flying a straight line if there's any breeze being blown away in a puff of um, whatever the northwesterly comes in that time, which is odd if you consider that actually the Montagues is a sub-Saharan migrant and actually flies um, up and has the longest migration of any of the three species. But that's how it is. The, um, the Montagues is actually the least sexually dimorphic in terms of size as well. The males are 95% of the size of the females. Um, the females are in plumage very similar to hen harriers. Um, they have a similar ring tail to them, but they are much narrower in the wing and um, much more pointed wings uh, for both the males and for the females. And in fact, one of the things to point out is that the actual adult female, hen harrier has five showing primaries. So we've got five tips showing on the adult female, uh, whilst, uh, and actually on the adult male, whilst on the Montague's harrier, only four tips show in the same way. And that accentuates the narrowness and the pointedness of the wing. Uh, included the picture of the juvenile. We do get uh, occasionally juveniles flying through the country and um, they are much more gingery underneath and very barred. Obviously, Montague's, the classic mark, which everybody knows, is the black lines through the secondaries. Um, they've actually got more extensive black tips than the Hen Harris compared with the Montague's. And the same white patch is there on both the male and the female, creating a ring tail. It's actually smaller and slightly less distinctive than on the hen harry. Uh, Western osprey, I think it's uh, one of those species which is um, incredibly familiar. Once you've seen it in its, it, so many pictures are uh, and films are taken of them, but most people have seen one even before they've seen it, if you see what I mean. Um, hang around, particularly in autumn uh, on our coast, on the Fish Lake Meadows, a good site. Tend to be big and white and very distinctive in that respect. Um, a medium sized hawk, fairly narrow in the wing, and that's because it basically plunge dives. But this again shows you that it is possible not only to see the difference between the sexes, but also um, as age progresses, it becomes progressively whiter in the wing um, and uh, more distinctive around the carpal marks. This is the, you know, these are the carpal marks here, which are not quite as well marked in the uh, younger birds but a relatively straightforward one to see. And I think most people don't need lessons in those. And I think, I think for the, just the, um, the last one in, put in the white-tailed eagle. Um, I think the confusion, if there is one, is that most people expect to see white-tailed white -tailed eagles. Um, white-tailed eagles are long-lived birds. They live to, 20 odd years, but um, probably longer than that. Although we haven't got any ringing records in the UK to tell us just how long they live. Um, but until they meet um, sexual maturity, which is after about four to five years, uh, the white tail is generally either um, 
totally lost in the juvenile plumage or starts to come through with an increasing amount of white within the black bands. So, but it is an enormous bird. There's no two ways about it. It's, um, maybe I should have said all the way through, if you talk about the next heaviest bird, the heaviest bird that we've just been talking about is about one and a half kilos for a female goshawk. A buzzard is about a kilo in weight. Uh, a white-tailed eagle, female, is five and a half kilos in weight. It's got a wingspan of about seven to eight feet, 2.2 um, meters. It is enormous. And um, if you see it with any other birds, and generally it comes with a cloud of crows, it's distinctive. It is known as the flying barn door for good reason. Of course, we, there were six released on the Isle of Wight in 2019, another six last year, although unfortunately, or seven were released, one died relatively soon. And they have been ranging widely, um, not only along the coast, but up through the country and crossing Hampshire. Sometimes they're seen, sometimes they're not. But there's something that we're going to, it, it's going to be a permanent addition to our avifauna, and it's something particularly in the Solent area we should be seeing more of. So just to sum up, points to remember. Um, most raptors are strongly sexual dimorphic, as I said. The females are larger than males to the extent that you can seem as though you're seeing a different species, even when, uh, when they're together and in pairs, even when actually they are the same species. Uh, the juvenile plumages are often poorly represented and it can take many years to reach maturity. It's the extent four to five years for the white-tailed eagle. Um, peregrines will take two years to get maturity. Most of the harriers are two to three years before they're actually mature. And those intermediate plumages are quite confusing. Um, Forage route is where you can't see the wing shape, the structure, and to some extent, the patterning under the wing, which is generally speaking, the most important thing um, in telling one species from another, if they're all perched up, become very, very difficult to tell. And that's where um, aspects of size and wing length in relationship to tail length is actually becomes important. Flight is important, but odd wind conditions can make species do strange things. I mean, quite a lot of us have seen buzzards hover, even though it doesn't appear to be said in the books that buzzards hover, they do, it's not limited to rough-leg buzzards. And um, it's amazing how some of the species that are fairly lazy flyers and don't appear to be particularly buoyant if you see them on uh, low wind days, when it becomes uh, more windy uh, or there's heavy thermals around, they suddenly look lighter and buoyant. So you have to be a little bit aware of the conditions around you. Habitat and where to expect species is important. Um, certainly if birds are resident there and they're on territory, but migrants can turn up anywhere. So that's an important thing to remember that just because it says it shouldn't be there, the birds haven't read the book. Hopefully you found that as a bit of a canter through um, the key parts, but I think it's important to say that fixed images are always very difficult to explain how birds work. BTO has put together some very interesting and very um, illuminating identification videos, particularly not only on species themselves, but on confusion pairs. For example, there's one on Kestrels and Merlin. There's one to have held buzzards and honey buzzards. Um, there's one on grey harriers, if you want to tell those apart. Um, bird facts are there on the web as well. And there's a link. Books are still valid. The flight identification of raptors of Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East is probably the best of the books that's out there specifically on raptors. 
Um, it was originally published in late 90s with uh, line drawings predominantly. And, but by 2016, the advances in digital photography have meant that uh, it is a substantially upgraded and um, enhanced book uh, for those who are very keen in that. And at the same time, they expanded it outside of Europe to North Africa and the Middle East. Birds of prey are not really particularly strong on calls, but um, then I can take for all of the bird calls so you can learn the difference between uh, the calls of the species, how to tell a kestrel call from a, a hobby call, for example, or buzzard from honey buzzard. They do sound very different as well. And uh, a worldwide one, which is um, also has photos, videos, and sound recordings, which are on a species by species basis is, is there as well. And all of those together form a resource which you can start to shelf learn how to bring this out. But I would always say that getting out in the field, I know it's difficult at the moment, but when we can, is the best way of learning. Okay, so probably gone over a few minutes. I apologize for that. Um, but uh, that's the end of the show. Martin, thank you so much. Uh, that's, that's been a fascinating, fascinating walk through the uh, Raptors we are possibly likely to see in, in our county uh, and further afield uh, as, we, as we explore. Martin, that's really fascinating. A really difficult one. I know I'll, I'll put my hand up as saying one I, I certainly struggle. Um, um, but certainly that tonight has really helped uh, myself, if no one else, I'm sure the lot of people. <laughs> but no, thanks again, Martin. I uh, really do appreciate um, a really thorough uh, walkthrough. You pretty much covered all the questions that were posted from what I see. Um, I'm sure you wouldn't mind if anyone has got any questions. If you post them through to Nicola, um, we'll find our way through to you, uh, if we may, given we're, we're up on time, if you wouldn't mind, Martin. But I think pretty yeah, much yeah. going through the questions no, no posted a bit in advance, you, you, I can, as far as I can see, you pretty much cover them all. So, Martin, thank you once again for a fascinating talk tonight, uh, a really broad and difficult topic to cover, and you've, you've, you've covered it fantastically well. So thanks again. And yeah, I know there were some questions about calls. I think it's, um, you know, we have to draw the line, otherwise we'll be sitting here at 10 o'clock tonight, um, unfortunately. But you've, gave, you've given some reference points to go, go, yeah. go do some further research on, which is which much appreciated. So uh, well done, Martin. Thank you very much uh, for everyone joining us tonight. And so hopefully we're good to, we'll see a good number of you at the weekend uh, for the AGM and uh, Members Day. But in the meantime, have a good evening and take care of yourselves the rest of the week. Thanks, Martin. Thank good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, all.